too bad, but yes, slowly grinding lower. 50 points lower, now 60 points lower, now almost 70 points lower for the Nifty. The Bank Nifty is the one that's dragging its feet, about 200 points lower on the Bank Nifty. And the Sensex is now down 250 points. So all four indices in the red, Sensex, Nifty, Midcap and the Bank Nifty. It's not alarming, but it's a cut of around three tenths of a percent. What's dragging today's technology stocks, Wipro, Infosys, HCL Tech are all in the red. Uh, Tata Steel, uh, some of the metal names also trending in the red right now. TCS, remember both TCS and Infosys come out with numbers on January the 11th. So in the run-up to that, there's a slight bit of caution. Banks are also under pressure. Indescent, Kotak Mahindra Bank, ICICI Bank all down about half a percent or so. So it's a dual combination. It's a combination of both uh, technology as well as banking names that's dragging the market a bit. What's holding afloat? Adani Group stocks ahead of that final Supreme Court verdict. Adani Group stocks up in the green. Enterprises ports up about three to five percent. M M is up seven tenths of a percent on that Motilal Oswal report. And then you have pharma names: Divi, Sipla, uh, Sun Pharma are all in the green. Reliance is also batting for the bulls this morning. So let's see how far that can go. But for now, the Nifty. Just hanging on to 21,600 by the skin of its teeth, down about 50 odd points. Not a great opening. Let's see how this goes. Well, that's right, Sonia. Well, plenty of stocks moving around actually from the broader markets. Uh, Moil came out with their uh, operational update for December as well as year to date. And it looks quite good because, uh, you know, they've grown by close to around 40% in dispatches as well as in terms of production. So the street likes that. The stock is up close to around 3.5%. On the flip side, a couple of stocks that did very well in the last few days, they are pulling back a little bit. Case in point being a Nalco. That's down close to around 3%. Yesterday ended at the high point of the day. Vodafone Idea posted a clarification coming out uh, from the management that, uh, you know, denying any sort of rumours that uh, any big party is looking at buying a big stake in the company. So that stock is down close to around 3%. But actually, it's pulled back all of those losses as we speak. Nalco, though, continues to struggle. You have Tata Steel that's down close to around a percent and a half. Kotak has gone ahead and downgraded the stock. They say that 20% rally that we've seen in the last two months, well, that's uh, not warranted for. A few more stocks uh, that are in focus today. You have, uh, you know, Sham Metallics. Stock is down close to under percent. They're going to be doing a QIP, so that's one of the reasons out there. BST Industries flying away. Um, uh, the money acquired more than two lakh shares via the block deal, so the street likes that. CSB Bank. Uh, I think uh, the street wasn't too impressed with regard to the operational update that they put up. I think Casa has come down, so the stock opened up with a cut of around one and a half percent for the time being. It's just holding with a cut of around half a percent. Sorry. Okay, so for the time being, we're holding 21,600 on uh, mid-caps. Of course, uh, the Adani Group, as Nigel mentioned, that's the one that's uh, really, uh, you know, surging away. Uh, RVNL won a small order to upgrade <coughs> one of the stations, 2% up on that stock as well. On Motherson wiring, there's a lot of uh, chatter uh, on uh, Samvardhana Motherson, actually, that, you know, uh, we might have Sumitomo selling a part or all of its stake. There's, you know, there's chatter, there's a money control report out there. Of course, we're also awaiting a response from the company. So just putting that out on the table as well. That's a stock down to 2.5% at least as of now. Lemon Tree, last I saw, was actually seeing more follow through, another 2-3% up after yesterday's massive surge on Lemon Tree. Uh, so that's a stock in focus on the upside as well. But uh, <clears throat> overall, the market's quiet, digesting, of course, the big run that we had towards the end of last year. Venugopal Gare, Managing Director at Bernstein, is with us. Venugopal, thank you very much for joining in. Season's greetings to you and wish you a very, very happy new year. Now, you are calling for a bit of sobriety, right? I think you're looking at 8% return this year and you're saying, you're telling, uh, you know, clients book profits. Tell us why. Uh, why the caution? Is it simply because of the run-up that we've seen, a very strong run-up in the last two months? Or do you see uh, any other risks or uh, red flags out there? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, this book profit call is clearly not consensus. The fact that even after releasing this report on Jan 1st, I've had conversations with quite a few investors. I don't think uh, investors at this juncture are too worried about both the macro and the earnings landscape. But the reality is that the fact that everybody across the board is struggling to figure out how to eke out decent size returns on India at this juncture. Now, interestingly, this is not just a challenge that portfolio managers are finding. This is a challenge which even analysts would find both across sell and buy side and in terms of a struggle to see how to increase their target prices. So believe me, you'll see a lot of creativity out this year in terms of trying to figure out how to generate more returns. But the reality is that valuation ceiling is fairly intense. Now, if you were to think about it, Earnings growth this year is fairly decent. Broadly, a mid-teens clip for the headline indices, and probably higher for Smiths. 
But the reality is that are we going to see earnings upgrade this year, especially in a year where macro is decent, but not necessarily going to see uh, an incremental positive momentum compared to what we saw last year, because last year was on a low base, right? So we swiftly moved up and quite rapidly moved up. So earnings upgrade cycle doesn't look like the case at this juncture, decent earnings though. The second thing is primarily that if I were to look at it, a lot of the uh, positives, especially around the rate cuts, which are expected this year, both from a US perspective as well as potentially from India, uh, we're also seeing a situation where broadly there is uh, a political certainty expected, and especially after the news flow post the state election results, that's also something which is priced in. So these are the positives, which essentially in our view are priced in. See, purely very quickly from a risk standpoint, the reality is that risks don't really announce themselves. They keep looming around somewhere. You just need to figure out whether those risks basically translate into a reality. For me, the, the simple things primarily are that a premature interest rate cut, in my view, would be a mistake. And that's primarily because it's going to revive inflation fairly quickly. And this I'm talking about global perspective. India's rate cycle cannot create any inflation. It's basically about what happens in the world. So that is something I would worry about. Number two, El Nino is still a risk from a point of view of monsoons and what, what it does to rural sort of uh, economy. Number three, primarily, would be the fact that US, there is still a lack of clarity on where they head in terms of economy. Now, if there is a rude shock or a sort of a really big shock out there, that's sort, sort of something which is not priced in. More importantly, there are wars going on. We don't know what happens to that, but these are like the outer cases. So there are some of these sort of macro global risks which are looming around, which we need to acknowledge. Mm. Okay. Uh, hi, Venu. Good morning and good to see you, Ven. We take your caution on board, but let's talk about a couple of sectors that did very, very well in the last 12 to 18 months. The power sector, you know, that's done very well. The question is, you all got it right on the upside. You know, stocks like NDPC and all have done well. What do you do from here? Will you take some money off the table or do you believe India's economic growth is going to be there? Power consumption is going to be the need of the art. And that's why you continue to hold on to these stocks because valuation by some of them are still not very, very expensive. Yeah, so in this entire construct of India Call, remember that everybody is running a fund where they need to have positions, right? So it's all a question of how do you actually outperform a nifty, which may not generate much returns. Number two is return expectations should be lower across the board, even if you pick stocks. But this is the year of bottom-up stock picking. Now, in that construct, since you mentioned about utilities and uh, stocks particularly, now the reality is, yes, this is an election year. Power... Uh, you know, you need to, of course, you know, ensure there are not too much of cuts, right? Uh, especially in heading into elections. And more importantly, there's a shortage going on. So these are fundamental underlying drivers which are going to lead to ordering, right? Doesn't lead to earnings growth suddenly for especially those which are regulated utilities don't have a merchant exposure. Probably merchant prices might still remain high for a while. So in that construct, you are aware of these potential possibilities which are the earnings drivers. Part of that is, of course, modeled. So the reality is that stocks have also moved up. They've more than doubled, probably have gone up even more than that in the last 12 to 18 months, reflecting the reality. We would be selective even in the utility sector, <laughs> but some of the ones that we still have in the India portfolio are you know, one of the largest uh, government-owned utility. It still looks okay. Uh, I mean, we're just still scraping through some return potential out there. So be selective even there, pick some stocks, but I would still say be careful about governance Utilities, you need to be careful about governance, especially in some of the stocks where there could be challenges. So stick to some of the safer names, which may not give you those sudden, you know, random risks. Got it, got it. Uh, Venugopal, uh, you know, just to understand how to position one's portfolio, right? Is there a higher propensity for a downside in the mid and small cap space compared to the large caps this year? And would you recommend taking positions out of the broader markets first rather than the large caps? Yeah, so we actually were big proponents of small and mid caps last year, all through the year. You know, we were we gave special allocations to Smith, but I have given up right now. So what it means is I'm unable to justify valuations. Two quick things that we look at is implied earnings growth for mid caps over a very longer period. When I say earnings growth is basically typically free cash growth, that's about 18% over the next 15 years. Of course, it's not possible to generate that, which means mid caps, of course, are trading above fair value at this juncture. That's a fundamental issue. Number two 
is mid caps in general and even small caps relative to nifty index are trading at their historic peak in terms of valuation sort of numbers so what it means is it probably makes sense to take profit in smit caps and that's the reason why we have turned an underweight on smits we haven't turned underweight on nifty but we have turned underweight on smits so that's the way area where we actually wanting to take profits we want to be still safe and nimble through the year of course so that's why we would prefer running with a few large caps but remember this is still going to be very bottom up here and there in terms of what we believe there is still potential for earnings to be decent or some upside risks and things like that and where valuations are mm. relatively okay compared to history okay just telling our viewers if you're wondering smid that's small and mid cap so <laughs> that's the the new acronym given the absolutely heady rally of 2023 in the smid space you know for the benefit of our viewers uh, uh, you know uh, venukopal just coming to you but for our viewers i just want to point out a lot of the very interesting calls and many of them are anti consensus calls that uh, bernstein has put out uh, of course one is the uh, the downgrade of the small and mid cap space itself but on sectors uh, they're overweight on financials which is fine so is you know a large section of the market Uh, Bernstein has upgraded IT services to an overweight, and they've downgraded consumer technology to an equal weight. They've upgraded telecom to an overweight, upgraded metals to an equal weight, and they're retaining their overweight in healthcare. And very interestingly, there's a downgrade on real estate and cement to equal weight, uh, and in consumer and industrials and utilities. Uh, uh, you know, Venugopal's team is saying uh, stay focused on very. selective ideas very interesting calls venugopal and i want to start off with it because financials is fine i think i mean we we've, dis- we've been discussing that with a lot of experts uh the expected up cycle in in banks and financials but it what makes you optimistic on it services now given the patchy record and you know very lackluster numbers that we've seen uh, growth numbers from these companies and you've downgraded consumer tech and actually that is where the numbers over the last couple of quarters have started looking better in terms of profitability and and break even so run us through the thought process here yes so you are right this is a non consensus call and usually non consensus calls are very tough to make so i'll tell you the thinking around this we wanted safety number one which was primarily centered around spaces which were large caps so remember consumer tech is usually smidish compared to it which is large caps in general especially some of the larger names Uh, with decent balance sheets free cash flows with potential for buybacks so you always have that downside protection remember one of the other things that we are not really saying that you're going to be heading into a sudden u turn for numbers in fact as we head into this quarter we are fully aware that the numbers that are going to come out are not not good right and i think even guidances might be tweaked and thing but the reality is that we are thinking that we are in situation for this particular sector where an earnings downgrade cycle to a large extent has played out and we're probably scraping the bottom and hence there is very limited interest in this sector this juncture so this is not an overowned sector from that perspective right and more importantly valuations have come down from historic peaks to below averages at this juncture so there is a huge comfort around this aspect so when these companies report bad numbers it would not surprise you say okay fine we were expecting this to be bad in any case so these are like signs of bottoming that we see for a this particular sector number 2 also remember that the broader thinking at this juncture which has not been say we are not building a us stock in our model right and if we were building a us stock i would have been technically underweight nifty and called for a 20% downside right i'm not even saying that so the reality is if we're going to see these first rate upticks what is the thinking people have in mind they would have in mind they say us probably will come back on a growth sense yes that will impact inflation later and impact india but that's like the second order impact so this sector plays into that right and that is the whole idea with which saying that look it's not really about near term momentum this is basically about this particular paradigm as to why we wanted to take this non consensus call hmm uh venugopal what about this entire financialization digitization theme in india that's really come to the fore right and there's been plenty of interest on that front Uh, will you still be looking to play that theme if yes how do you play that you have discussed this in the past as well that that's something that's made india stand out actually and that was offering big potential how much has played out yeah so look this is consumer tech is a 1015 year theme right so i don't think that theme will go away and so is the case with india india is a 1015 year theme that's not going to go anywhere right see but the reality is we have had some successes last year in consumer tech in terms of one particular theme i was playing which was basically a loss to a break even theme Now, if you look at most of the consumer tech tech companies, they've actually moved from a loss to a break even to a marginal profit, right? 
So to a large extent, quite a few of the frontline stock that we used to like have actually played out. And that is the reason we prefer booking profits. Number two is that the journey from here is still there, but it is not going to be as swift and as linear as we saw the previous year. So that is the other expect the, the other thought process that we have. Number three, you would see a swath of IPOs. And believe me, these will be low quality IPOs, which will come out who are timing, trying to time basically the pre-election situation where the markets are bullish. They're going to spoil the image of the consumer tech sector again. So remember this aspect. So the entire sector basically sees a challenge because of that. So put in all into picture primarily, we've turned to an equal weight on consumer tech rather than turning underweight at this juncture. Right? So we would still probably be looking at some areas where there are some valuation cushions and things like that. But this is the reality of why we decided to shift. You know, uh, this is not at any call. This is basically about now, here and now for the near term. Okay. Uh, there is also an upgrade that you've done to the metal sector. You've upgraded metals to equal weight. Now, I want to understand that a little bit more. Is this a multi-year call? Is this a structural up move? Uh, because, you know, that is one space that didn't participate in the rally last year. So are you looking yeah. at it as a valuation game? You're right. So basically, I never look at metals from a structural perspective ever. So it is all about taking those opportunities where you think there are some rebound potential. See, there has been some firming up of metal prices through the end of last year as well, right, from October number. Number two is that's a sector which has, along with IT services, seen the most downgrades. I mean, we've seen a downgrade cycle for that last year and the year before as well. I went into an underweight on metals two years back. So about two and a half years back, it was actually peak uh, of stocks like Tata Steel. But the reality is at this juncture, I don't really see a situation where earnings growth expectation of consensus looks wrong. I think that looks fairly okay. And that is basically about some growth coming back, right? And that's the reality as to why I feel that perhaps it doesn't make sense to go or remain underweight in metals. And that's also a laggard. And actually some of these laggards might see flow of money as long as you're comfortable with the fact that there's going to be no further earnings downgrades. A complete tactical shift, you know, to uh, as to what we have done at this juncture. I'm not taking a, not even, I'm not even taking a one-year call on metals, honestly. All right, uh, Venugopal, thanks so much for stopping by, giving us, uh, you know, that view on the market, sounding a little bit cautious and maybe for good reason. This longer-term story is definitely intact for India, but maybe in the near term, taking some money off the table may not be such a bad thing. Thanks so much for joining and giving us that view. Well, let's focus on uh, the next corporate that we have on the show, Blue Star. That's the next company on our radar. The recent checks suggest that the company has seen robust demand from Tier 2 as well as uh, other towns as well. Mr. Thiagarajan, the Managing Director at Blue Star, joins us on the show. Hi, Mr. Thiagarajan. First of all, Happy New Year to you as well as your entire team at Blue Star and wishing you all the best for 2024. But let's talk about the year and now. Off late, how has demand been shaping up? Do you see enough traction? And uh, are your estimates for the year, what you had set out for for FI24, is it, uh, uh, you know, in line? Good morning, Nigel. Happy New Year to you uh, and your colleagues. Uh, it has been a great year, 2023, and uh, we look forward to a, a very, very strong summer season ahead. Um, as you're aware, uh, the results will be out on uh, 30th of uh, January. I won't be able to talk about specific numbers, but uh, the, the year went on well uh, on the whole. After a washout in the summer season, uh, the demand bounced back. It was the demand continued to be robust during the festival season, uh, not only for the room air conditioners, commercial refrigeration products, as well as large air conditioning systems, did extremely well during 2023. Uh, as we move to 2024, the complete industry is bullish. You might have seen uh, reports, the, the India is going to be the fastest growing market for air conditioning. And uh, it will be the fastest growing market for commercial refrigeration as well, including cold chain. And in fact, uh, the, the World Bank report suggests that the market size will be close to 1.4 trillion USD by 2040. And uh, that, that uh, again brings in the issue of sustainability and the industry is working on multiple aspects as well. How to grow the market, how to grow it responsibly as well. 
All right, uh, Mr. Tiagrashan, we take that on board. You know, I'm just looking through a note that's coming from Nirmal Bang. They say that there's a gap between the industry's capacity addition and penetration into the RAC, that's room air conditioners. For you, what is your capacity utilization levels as of now? Uh, so this had been clarified last year itself that, uh, you know, the market size in India would cross around uh, 10 million units and Blue Star was expected to cross around 1 million units. You will see the figure as, as you move forward. And uh, we do have a capacity closer to that as of now. And CCT phase 2 is under commissioning. So FI24 will be taken care of. FI25 will be, will be ready ahead of the time. And as far as the capacity is concerned, thanks to the PLI scheme, the industry capacity in about three year time should be doubling from what it was last year. And the market is also expected to grow. Uh, I, I mentioned it is going to be one of the fastest growing markets as well. Uh, so good morning and happy new year to you <coughs> and your entire team. This is Sonia here. Thank you for joining us uh, today. I wanted to talk a little bit about the pricing pressure or the price, so-called price wars that are, uh, you know, underway in, in your sector. I was reading out of a report which suggested that both Daikin and Lloyd have either been reducing their prices or discounting the channel quite aggressively. Uh, how are you uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, coping up with that? Have things gotten worse compared to say six months ago and what is the prognosis as far as pricing is concerned? Good morning, Surya. Happy New Year to you. Uh, this is going to be the case actually. The manufacturing capacity is doubling. There is a PLI scheme. The market will have to grow and uh, it has to happen in tandem. In the meanwhile, the, the India is the happening place uh, and who is who will be here and the competition will intensify. We have learned to compete. You, you have seen our track record over the past three years, and we have a modest market share goal. I have stated by FI25, we should be targeting a 15% market share. We are on course with that particular target. You have to compete in the market. You have to improve the margins through uh, innovation, uh, value engineering. And most importantly, this I had pointed out, I have pointed out in many forums. The entire uh, PLI scheme, uh, which is close to some 4,500 crores now, that is going to get diluted in terms of pricing. Uh, any mm. PLI scheme improves the manufacturing capacity and uh, the PLI is paid uh, on the sales growth, right? The, the nomenclature production linked incentive is misguiding. The PLI is paid on incremental sale over FI21 figures. So therefore, I have to keep showing incremental growth. So are my competitors. In the process, I think that money is going to the consumer's hand. The market will grow. The scale will be built. So there is there is no doubt that the competition will intensify. Thanks to backward integration, thanks to innovation, you should be able to manage the margin. Most importantly, the operating leverage due to scale. That is what has benefited us throughout right. the 2000s. That's, that's what we are hoping. Uh, that's interesting. So you're saying that competition will definitely intensify, but you are holding on to your 15% market share target by FY25. I'm trying to understand what could the extent of the reduction in prices be. Um, I understand that there will be operating leverage benefits because of scale, but how much do you think prices could head lower? And from your end, uh, what is the game plan? Uh, so, uh, there are many variables in that. Uh, number one, I, uh, let me assume that the commodity prices, which is, which is an unknown animal, a number of things happen out there, I would assume that that is going to be stable. That assumption I will make. The exchange rate assumption I will make that will be stable. And energy label change is not going to be there throughout the year. Uh, it happened last year. Again, it will happen only year after. Within this parameter, one important thing that is happening is more than 65% of the market is shifting to tire three, four, five uh, towns. And you have close to 52% of the sale happening through consumer finance. The next one is you are having 92% of the consumers are first time buyers. So the entry level products are the ones that are getting sold. So my my, if you ask me to guess, I I think the prices are at the lowest level at this point of time. If the summer demand is good, the prices will hold. 
If summer demand is not picking up, it, it varies. Uh, some, somewhere around uh, maximum of 5% reduction can take place. See, each of the element I told you is a huge cost. Consumer finance is a very huge cost that you have to bear. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> no, so hi, season's greetings to you. Uh, actually, good that you brought that up. I, I mean, my, my first question was actually on margins, just to complete that point. Despite the competitive intensity, and as you said, obviously, uh, you know, there's some benefit I'm supposing that's coming in from softening raw material prices. So all things put together, the improvement in margins that we had started seeing, I mean, you were at 6% at the end of the second quarter. I'm not asking for a specific figure, but in general, despite competition, can you at least hold margins where they are, if not improve them? Uh, good morning, Surabhi. Uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this also I have clarified. I used to think till uh, FI21 that uh, getting a EBIT margin of somewhere around 10% is possible. It came down to 9. Today, if you ask me, I think uh, in the next three-year time frame, anywhere between 8 to 8.5% operating margin is only possible. This is happening precisely due to the factors that you highlighted. Okay, mm -hmm. the, got that. So that gives us a sense of, you know, the, the sustainable margin run rate that perhaps uh, that, you know, companies in the space will have to contend with. Now, just to, you know, talk about the other point, you mentioned consumer financing and, you know, 90% uh, of the sales are happening through that channel. And that's where the RBI had tightened screws. Now, it's been a couple of months since, you know, this has played out uh, through the system. Uh, what do you see on ground? Uh, you know, how how is pricing shaping up? How are banks and NBFCs looking at a lot of the, uh, you know, the consumer loans that they were ga giving out, where risk weights went up and therefore, you know, just the cost of giving those loans went up? Uh, uh, fortunately, fortunately, we have not seen any major change post the announcement in the past couple of months. And uh, there is also intense competition. Uh, the NBFCs are betting on this particular uh, space. And uh, imagine this is a 35,000 rupee kind of uh, financing per unit. And I, I think they will be in a position to manage uh, without increasing the rates. And I'm only hoping on the competition between them that we should be able to. But then uh, the same point, it's a level playing field. I would be worried that if Blue Star only is at a disadvantage, which is not so. Okay. Uh, all right, sir. Uh, have a great 2024. Thank you for joining in and speaking to CNBC TV 18. So that's Blue Star. The stock has gone up 60% in the last one year, but there is definitely competition kicking in now. There's a pricing war, so to speak. And he says that this is only because of uh, growth that is coming through. So everyone wants to get ahead in the market. And this is leading to, uh, you know, operation leverage as well. Uh, we'll take a quick break. On the other side of the break, Rakesh Verma, the founder and chairman and managing director at Mapma India will join in. The board has approved uh, 500 crore fundraising via the QIP route. So we'll speak more about what they plan to utilize the funds for. We will also connect with the management of Senko Gold and Diamonds to discuss demand trends amidst the grand wedding season. What has the response been? More on that coming up. Welcome back here with us on Corporate Radar and uh, time now to talk to the next company on our radar. CE Infosystems or Map My India is the next one that we're looking at. 
the company's board has approved a 500 crore rupee equity fundraise. This is going to be through the QIP route to talk about this. And of course, plans ahead for the company in 2024. We have with us Rakesh Verma, founder and chairman, as well as managing director of MapMy India. Uh, Mr. Verma, thanks very much for joining in. Season's greetings to you. Wish you a very, very happy new year to begin with. Now, if you could just explain to us why the need to raise more uh, more equity funds. I think the QIP uh, enabling uh, sort of resolution is 500 crores, if I'm not mistaken. And you already have cash on the books. If you could just tell us what's the latest cash position, why you're raising this money and what the plans are. Thank you so much for me being on the air today with C CNBC. Uh, well, to answer your question straight, we have approximately 450 to 500 crores in our cash and cash equivalent in our books today. Uh, your second question relates to why we are raising funds. See, MapMindia has always from the past looked forward to a long-term business growth. And you, you have seen that 20 years back, we could think of uh, getting into mapping business, a digital map which is pay, paying us a dividend today. We are again looking forward to the next 5, 10 years. So when you think like that, you better plan your activities accordingly. So in our case, when we figured out that the future business growth, long term I'm talking about, would be coming from the international market, will be coming from the drone business. These two are the B2B and B2B2C business growth opportunity. And we want to get ready with that and hence the need for the QIP. The growth opportunities that you speak of, uh, could they also be inorganic in nature? Because you're building a, a, a nice, uh, comfortable war chest of, you know, close to 1,000 crores. Yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, I won't say inorganic. See, the, when you try to think of the business growth, you look at both organic and inorganic. Like in the case of IoT, what we did, we did go with this inorganic part also to expand our bandwidth in the IoT business. So one doesn't, we don't just make a decision that we'll go only organic or inorganic. It all depends on the opportunity that comes across. Okay, uh, just to get some of those, uh, you know, growth targets, uh, just to confirm them, 40% uh, growth is what you were looking at in FY24. I think you're holding on to that, if I'm not wrong. And this 1,000 crore revenue milestone in the next four to five years, um, is that on track and how do you plan to get to that? If you can just share, a, you know, sort of a long-term strategy with us. Sure. First, it's on track. I guess uh, our Q3 results for FY24 will be out so not too far away. Hmm. That will that will give you one level of comfort. The second part is, you know, when you look at the automotive business, one of the drivers for us, for which we made, built the technology of what we call it case on top of pure vanilla navigation. Mm. There's no doubt that the electrification of the vehicles, two-wheeler or four-wheelers are happening at a very fast pace. That's one of our dri uh, dri uh, dri driver growth uh, for us. Mm. Second is when you look at the connected services with the internet in every vehicle, that's adding or giving us the power of uh, growing our business in that sector. For fi Finally, if I say that for safety features in any vehicle, ADAS is becoming popular. So between all the three, the automotive OEM business is poised for a huge growth as the time comes by. So that, that will help us, uh, part of it will help us achieve our target of that 1,000 crore what we have talked about, built on the technology that we have already done. Is there scope to, uh, you know, increase your margins further? I mean, you had a very strong performance in the last couple of quarters, clocking in anywhere between 43, 44% margins. Uh, but you have given a guidance of, I think, 40% by the end of the year. But over the next couple of years, right, just trying to understand a long-term strategy, is there scope to increase margins substantially from these levels? Uh, look, margins can be easily increased it all depends on how you want to look at the future of the business we try to invest that additional margin into creating new pr products or technology and that's why we have given a normal uh, 40 percent kind of a margin guidance hmm. 
All right. Hi, Mr. Verma. Nigel on the set and good to see you in. Just to reconfirm, sir, in the first half of the year, you'll have grown by 27%. For the year, you're guiding for 40%. Means the second half of the year, you have to grow by 50%. Just confirming, that's on track, right? Very much on track. We are not... Right. Uh, H2 is always much better than H1. Got it. Now, just... Just wanted to confirm that, sir, because the asking rate is 50% for the second half of the year. Let's get that out of the way then. Now, with regard to this utilization of this 1,000 crores, by when will you come up with a detailed plan? Because the street would like to know, right? You've got big ambitions, you know, you're looking at scaling up revenues in the next few years as well. So by when could we get a detailed breakdown? Say, you know, out of this 1,000 crores, how do you intend to use it? So let us put it in two parts. One is what we have already discussed, the 1,000 crore milestone for a roadmap for the next four or five years based on our right. maps and IoT business for the domestic market. What we are talking about the additional 500 crores is for the international market and drone as a service business. Now, when you look at them and building up the technology product and the, creating the market for them, so that's for the, not the next five years, that's for the next 10 years I'm talking about. That is how it, the overlap is there. Hmm. So if you're asking about the breakup, yeah. I'm giving you the break. I gave you the breakup. Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your thoughts here on CNBC TV 18 and uh, uh, all the best for this year. So that is uh, Map My India with a 1,000 crore revenue target over the next uh, uh, three to five years. And of course, very optimistic on the way forward. But by the way, don't lose sight of A, the market, which is under some pressure right now. So the Nifty is down almost 100 points. Um, and the Sensex is down 350 points, so not looking like a good day so far. And B, the Adani uh, group stocks, which are doing very well ahead of that final Supreme Court verdict of the Adani Hindenburg case. Now, Sonia, since you brought up the market, I just wanted to put on board as well, just so that we have the context. Actually, we're not alone because a lot of the Asian markets are down a lot mm -hmm. right now. Uh, you've got uh, the Kospi, for instance, down a full 2%. Hong Kong's down over a percent as well. Even um, in some of the other markets like Australia, etc., falling quite a bit. Uh, so declines of one to two percent across Asia. I mean, I think that's a little comfort that uh, we can take. That at least it's not an India-specific fall. It is a bit of a global risk off playing. And out. why not, right? I mean, we've had such a very, such a strong run. Some money being taken off the table won't harm anyone. But we are in the thick of the big Indian wedding season. A total of 35 lakh weddings are scheduled in this season. We also had a delayed festival period this time around. So let's find out how demand for jewellery has been. So Vankar Sen, the Chief Executive Officer at Senko Gold and Diamonds, joins us now to talk more about that. Um, uh, thanks a lot for joining in, uh, Mr. Sen. You know, this is a season uh, that has been the best so far that at least I have seen in the last maybe five, six years. But you tell me, how was Q3 in terms of volumes, same-store sales growth, prices, if you can give us both the absolute figures and compare it to the last wedding season. So see Q3, uh, you know, if you look at the beginning of Q3 with the festive season and the weddings that are all lined up, we've seen a very uh, handsome growth in the first half of Q3, uh, which is October, November. Uh, what we have seen is that post uh, mid-December, when we suddenly saw the gold prices moving up and the wedding season just taking a little bit of a break, Therefore, there we have seen consumers just coming to the stores, exploring, uh, waiting to take a decision. But all in all, uh, if you really look at it, we are looking at about, uh, uh, you know, I have I guided before as well that on a year-on-year -year basis, we've seen a 20 to 25 percent growth in terms mm -hmm. of the overall uh, sales figure. And uh, we are optimistic that coming forward with the Q4 and the wedding season uh, continuing to happen, uh, we will continue to see a, a handsome growth. The only the deterrent that is working in the mind of the consumer is that yes, at one end, the increase in price of gold is uh, is a uh, is kind of creating some kind of apprehension. But at the same time, people are feeling very elated and happy that the gold that they all possess, the value is going up, and indirectly, the faith on the uh, commodity as gold and diamonds is also uh, on the rise. So this is the mixed reaction we are seeing at the consumer end. But uh, we are looking at a 20, 25 percent growth, and the best part is that uh, which will uh, indirectly help on the margins is the growth in diamond jewelry. With the mm -hmm. gold price going up, 22 carat gold jewelry, prices are on the upper side. So people are looking at uh, 14 carat, 18 carat products, and uh, therefore uh, diamond jewelry for various special occasions, uh, be it anniversaries mm -hmm. or gifting, that has become a, a bigger kind of a demand, and we are looking at a higher growth in diamond jewelry segment. 
which will help okay. uh, consumers be happy as well as the uh, you know the profit for the company to be on okay. the better side just one clarification you said you have seen 20 to 25 percent growth in q3 so far right yes 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 okay but earlier for the full year you had guided a growth of 18 to 20 percent for fy24 would you hold on to that or would you want to scale that up as well no i would continue to say 18 to 20 percent q3 is usually a, a much better uh, quarter mm. and we have seen that you know in the edge uh, first half of the year things have been on the growth path but uh, with the mm. gold price on the upward trend i will continue to say 18 to 20 percent but q3 has been a a good quarter in terms of 20 to 25 percent growth compared to last all year. right Okay, got it. Hi, Mr. Sen. Good morning. Nigel on this side. Well, a two-part question with regard to what you just mentioned itself. First, in terms of diamonds as a percentage of your mix, where do you see that number headed with the timeline, point number one? Point number two is, as you said, gold prices have moved up. So what's your hedging strategy? So, uh, you know, di diamond as a share of uh, the whole jewelry that we sell, uh, it has grown from last year. Today, we are close to 12% as the share uh, of the overall jewelry that we sell. And we are aiming uh, to take it towards 15%. So that has been a hot process with which we have been working. And then our fellow players uh, in the industry have uh, achieved such numbers. So it is not an impossibility. So this is a, a good thing uh, in the long run. And in terms of the hedging strategy, you know, in spite of the gold prices on the upward trend, we have always been following uh, where minimum 80% of our inventory stays hedged. So whatever uh, we see the margins and uh, the growth, uh, we are getting the margins from the making charges and not really from the increase in gold prices. So we continue to remain minimum 80% hedge for all our inventory, even though the gold prices are on the upward trend. Mr. Sen, since you're saying that your share of the studded mix will go up, uh, can you give us some idea on uh, how you see overall margins playing? Or I'm not asking Q3 or Q4, but in general, if I look at the, the you know historic trend, uh, you have been, uh, you know, in uh, around 7.5%, 7.8%. So as a share right. of diamond jewellery goes up, and I don't know how you're looking at making charges. I'm not sure how competitive, uh, you know, your region is. But uh, uh, is there a way you could perhaps look at margins of 8%, 9%? What's the medium-term plan on margins? I'll tell you what, uh, uh, you know, a 7 to 8% margin, it is in that range that one continues to play. A half percent here and there is always a possibility because with the increase in diamond share, uh, you know, it only gives you that strength in the bottom line. But at the same time, because we are a growing company, one has to uh, continue to remain competitive uh, with the increase in gold prices. You need to give offers and, you know, benefits to the consumers so that they keep getting attracted uh, on buying the jewelry and buying in bulk. So it is, a, it is a balance that you need to do between your margins and your growth. And that is where, you know, we, while the possibility of increasing the margins by half percent is always there, but you again reinvest. You know, there are new formats, the Everlight, which is the lightweight diamond uh, jewelry and gold jewelry uh, products and collections that we have. We wanted to create a smaller format store with that. Uh, invest in branding in various uh, you know uh, mediums, uh, digital medium, reaching out to customers. So it's a balance between growth and margin, but it surely will give you a strength in the bottom line. Okay, and as you had guided earlier, I think margins in the second half will be better than the first half, right? Yes, yes, it, it is Got always it. like that. With the January, February, Valentine's Day, we call yeah. it the love season. <laughs> you know the anniversary. So it's all about love right now. Anniversary, Valentine's Day, whoops, it's going to be quite... Don't give, uh, don't give us ideas. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, going to be quite, it's going to be a little bit difficult on the wallet, but I'll try to manage that. Uh, let's get back to your numbers though, Mr. Sen. What about the store opening? Could you tell us how many have you opened, uh, say in quarter three, year to date, how many as well have you opened? And how many of them right. are you know, company-owned, franchise-owned? How do you see this number move up? So, so we've, we've crossed 150 stores. So as we speak, mm. we are 153 stores right now. Uh, in quarter three, we have opened around uh, four to five stores uh, in quarter three. And in the coming quarter, we intend to open uh, three stores more. So we have opened approximately 18 to 20 stores in this. We will be opening uh, by the end of the year uh, for the whole financial year. And that is what we've been planning, that on a sustainable basis, uh, we should be able to open 15 to 20 stores year on year, uh, year after year. So that is how we are, uh, you know, planning the mm. whole uh, game for the next three to five years.
it will be company owned or franchise owned no it's a mix of company owned and franchise owned so around uh, 60 to 70% will be company owned and 30 to 40% will be franchise owned so say for example 12 to 14 are company owned company operated and 6 to 8 will be franchise okay i have a couple of quick questions what's the market share currently that senko gold is enjoying uh, you know, market share for our industry, if you look at it, it's called a, it's like a 7 lakh crore uh, uh, size of the industry. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, last financial year, we did about 4,200 crore. And if you look at the various, uh, you know, uh, players that are playing in the market. So, mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, it will be on for the, for the in the national level around 1, 1.5%. 1 but then if you break it down to east and north, you know, uh, which share is which part of the country. And then you see that, okay, in Eastern India, maybe we are sharing uh, a market share of three to four. But this is all estimate because there is no, uh, you know, there is no like a proper survey proper. to say got the it. market share. Mm. Okay, got it. But at least helps us understand, right, how much of the market that you're enjoying, especially in parts like Eastern India, etc. Uh, since you right. talked about buying gold and, uh, you know, someone like me who has been a consumer of gold, diamonds, etc. over the years, I find it very difficult to buy gold online. But I do understand that players like you are looking to sort of uh, grow your online channel. It's currently about 4-5%, but you're targeting 30-35%. Do you think it's going to be a struggle to get there? I just wanted to understand what is the online strategy now uh, for Senko? No, so see, online, there are two parts to it. Uh, you know, if when you look at the lighter jewelry, which is, say, anything between 10,000 to 25, 30,000, people are getting comfortable to buy online uh, because the risks are lower and it's for gifting or for personal use. So when it comes to the lightweight jewelry, online uh, sales are doing well. When it comes to a little bit of a heavier jewelry, then online becomes a direct-to-consumer platform in which the consumer is having to look at the various designs, look at the prices, uh, compare, take a decision, and then contact these stores. And, you know, it's as we call the digital-led uh, business. And then they take a decision, go to the store and take it physically. So this is how online has to be used as a media to reach out to consumers. So uh, for us, as you said, that it's around 3 to 4%. But 35% is, is, is not really a share of the overall sale that you see as online is going to take some time. It will remain because the growth will happen. But the digital-led sales is something that will uh, keep mm. growing. The, people, the lead generation will happen. People will uh, ask for inquiries and then go to the store and close yeah. the deal. Okay, all right, Mr. Sen. You know, thanks so much for joining in. And as you gave us your growth outlook and you told us the big triggers, anniversaries and Valentine's Day, you put me in a difficult spot. But I'm lucky my wife is hearing this conversation. She said she doesn't want gold for this year. So, <laughs> for me, it's a story of next year at least. Thanks so much for joining and wishing Thank you and your you. company all the best. Looking forward to chatting with you post your number. Thanks. Very expensive uh, Valentine's Day for many people, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm saved this year at least. I'm, 2024 is okay. I'm Now I'm looking at 2025. <laughs> but anyway, let's get Mitesh back in. Uh, Mitesh, uh, you know, we have a market that's uh, been open for the last 45 minutes or so. And we're down close to around 100 points. At lower levels, there was some sense of buying. Yesterday, we bounced from 21,555. And today as well, it seems that level has held out. How do you trade from here? Rajal, I think uh, my overall belief still remains that we are going through a deeper pullback. And this decline, what we are seeing since the last couple of days, could extend a bit. So there is a minor pivot around 21,480 mark. So that's a support. But you know what is important today is the Nifty IT index. That's given a breakdown on charts, and I think that's where you can have some kind of shorting positions. So a TCS is something in which I would recommend uh, taking a shot with a stop at about 3770. Uh, it's come down a bit for targets of around 3600. And the other one uh, which I would recommend uh, taking a shot is Wipro with a stop at 465 for targets of around 443. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll do one thing. We'll take a short commercial break on that note. On the other side of the break, lots more coming up. Uh, Manisha will be joining in to give us an update on the volatility in the commodity markets and lots of stock talk as well. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. Well, let's talk about the commodity markets now. Equities, of course, uh, feeling red this morning. Manisha is here. Manisha, hi, morning. So what's the latest and uh, what do you have your eye on? Well, I have an eye on gold. I mean, you were discussing all the jewellery market and the kind of events that are lined up for the first quarter. Just let me tell you on how the prices can pan out as well during this time. Well, diamonds clearly can be a better choice because we've seen diamond prices decline by 30% in the previous year. But when it comes to gold, well, we've started this year on a very strong note at around $2,050 an ounce. Remember, last year was the best in three years that we saw the kind of gains come in at around 13% on the higher side. We also saw all-time highs in case of gold prices, uh, to be exact, $2,150 in dollar terms. And for the Indian markets, we saw 64,000 rupees per 10 grams. And if you look at the prices right now, we are not too far away from those kind of levels. And expectations are that you could be looking at higher highs, new all-time highs in 2024 as well. Well, if you look at the, the markets itself, it has been on the stronger side because there are expectations of rate cuts going forward. There is an expectation that you could be looking at around 60 rate cuts happen in the first quarter itself by various global central banks. The geopolitical tensions have been adding premiums to the gold prices also. There also is strong global central bank buying that we've seen. And apart from that, the ETF buying in the previous quarter itself was into billions of dollars, anticipating that you could see a spillover of that happen in this quarter as well. What you will need to watch out for into the markets is uh, the U.S. Fed meeting minutes that are going to be released today. And then on Friday, you have the U.S. non-farm payroll data as well coming in. We already have done a high of 2150, but going forward, there are expectations that you could be looking at levels of 2200 and beyond. JP Morgan is quite bullish at $2,300 per ounce and of an average price expectation for 2024. 2150 is what UBS believes can be an average. 2100 is coming in from TD as well. If you look at Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, well, they are expecting higher levels as well at around $2,200 per ounce on the higher side. Less bullish is what you have seen coming from Metal Focus at 950 of an expectation. And the least bullish is Fitch, which expects that 1800 also is a possibility for this year itself. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, Manisha. Well, let's talk about Tata Steel. That stock is under pressure today. Kotak has gone ahead and downgraded the stock to reduce from buy. They say, yes, the stock is up closer on 20% in the last two months, but fundamentals actually have deteriorated at the margin. And they've given five big points that are pulled out. One is that the domestic margins were under pressure because the raw material prices have moved higher at a faster clip in comparison to steel prices. So that's point number one. The second factor is Europe continues to remain under pressure, both on demand as well as on pricing and margin contraction as well. So Europe will continue to bleed. Now, all eyes are on the expansion here in India. And the India business actually looks very, very good. But the KPO2 uh, expansion, that's the one that will drive growth. Mm -hmm. But that could possibly be risk in terms of delays which is a bit of a problem point. The other point that they've highlighted is capital allocation risk with, uh, you know, that's increasing because Europe could be in a sticky spot and that's where additional cash could have to move out there to support those operations. That's what in turn could make capital allocation a little bit challenging. And finally, they say, yes, uh, you know, the UK operations, they managed to strike that deal with the government, but there could be a possible delay in that UK resolution. So put all this together, Kotak has gone ahead and downgraded the stock and they've listed these broad points with regard uh, to why they're a little bit skittish on the stock post that 20% up move that we've seen in the last two months. Okay, that's uh, Tata Steel in focus today. Uh, by the way, just want to point out that today's intraday low so far is exactly the same as the low that we made yesterday, which is uh, the level of uh, 21,550. Today it's 556, yesterday it was 555. So market's taken support over there and it's trying to you know, see if some buyers come in or not. Uh, but it's proving to be a little tough so far, given the fact that uh, IT continues to struggle quite a bit. Large cap IT emphasis, Tech Mahindra, TCS, Wipro. So complete slam dunk on IT. And banks, in any case, are not providing uh, much comfort or much support. Mid caps, I mean, this was very similar to the trade that played out yesterday. Relatively speaking, mid caps have bounced back. But uh, IT is a problem child. Yeah. Uh, just to talk about the Adani group as well, all of those stocks are actually retaining gain and actually building on some of that gain as well. Mm -hmm. So Adani Enterprises, Ports, uh, Adani Green, all of those stocks are up uh, up and about. So gains between 3% to 6 7 Just one point, Surbhi. Yesterday the low was 21,555. Today the low is 21,556. That's what, yeah. And from mm -hmm. there we have bounced close to 35, 40 points out. So let's see whether or not, you know, that can hold out for today, 21,550. Let's see whether we can bounce mm -hmm. in there. Absolutely. Okay. So I guess on that note, uh, we will take a 
very quick break. Uh, come back on the other side and uh, we'll have uh, uh, Lata joining in with uh, today's edition of uh, It's the Economy. The Indian economy has clearly been the gold medalist of 2023 with a likely 6.5% GDP growth fastest among large economies. Of course, even as the large US economy grew by 5% in the third quarter, uh, uh, US and global economies clearly expected to slow in 2024. So what really lies ahead? All of these trends will be discussed uh, when we come back. All right, well, the Supreme Court is scheduled to announce its judgment on the Adani Hindenburg case at 10.30 a.m. today. Remember, the SEBI has completed its probe in 22 of the 24 cases initiated post the Hindenburg report. Ashmit is joining in from the Supreme Court uh, to tell us what to expect this time around, or rather, you know, all the events that have led uh, to this day. Ashmit, hi, good morning. Understand that the Supreme Court judgment is only moments away now. The Supreme Court is expected to pronounce its judgment at 10:30 a.m. Uh, it's said to be authored by the Chief Justice himself, Justice D.Y. Chandrachud. Now, here are the key takeaways. Number one, SEBI has submitted before the Apex Court that, as far as the Adani investigations are concerned, out of 24 cases, the investigation has been completed in 22. Uh, not just that. Uh, what's important are crucial observations that the Apex Court has made. Uh, number one, on demand for an SIT. Here, the Supreme Court has, uh, has observed that there is no reason to doubt the SEBI investigation. There is no material that has been made available by the petitioners. Number two, on the issue of disclosure of the findings of the Adani investigation, on that count, again, the Supreme Court has observed that there is no reason for the Supreme Court to prejudge uh, these, uh, these SEBI findings and that SEBI shall be allowed uh, to proceed as per law. Uh, importantly, on the issue of conflict of interest within the expert committee itself, that is also something that the Supreme Court said that not enough material has been brought on board for the Supreme Court to intervene and to doubt uh, the integrity of uh, the expert committee members. And importantly, the Supreme Court also made observations uh, that with respect to the volatility that was seen post the Hindenburg report, that is something where the expert committee recommendations need to be taken on board, where SEBI needs to deliberate and needs to work upon. So clearly, three to four questions uh, that can be addressed here by the Apex Court. All eyes now on the top court, court number one. Uh, we'll have clarity in just moments from now. Hey, literally, just about 15 minutes to go, Ashmit. Uh, you have a busy day ahead of you. Thanks very much, and we'll keep touching base uh, as and when details start coming in from that judgment. We'll take a quick break on... Uh, actually, no, we're not taking that break. We're straight away heading to that discussion on the economy, what lies ahead for India in 2024. Lata has a whole host of experts with her. So over to Lata. <laughs> Thank you. 
The Indian economy has clearly been the gold medalist of 2023 with a likely 6.5% GDP growth in calendar 23, fastest among large economies. Of course, even the US economy grew by 5% in Q3 and that's helped. But US is expected to slow in 2024 to as low as 1.2% by some estimates. Even global growth is expected to slow by at least half a percentage point versus 2023. So how will India fare? On growth, on interest rates, on rupee? Well, I have with me an elite panel of economists and bankers. Samran Chakraborty, Chief Economist at City, Neeraj Gambhir of Axis Bank, Shantanu Sengupta of Goldman Sachs, and Sakshi Gupta of HDFC Bank. Gentlemen and Sakshi, thank you very much for your time. Uh, hope it's a grand new year uh, for all of you. Let me start with you, Samiran. Uh, uh, exactly that, the growth question. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we've done very well in FY24 with probably 7%. But uh, uh, how's FY25 looking? Will global clouds bring us down drastically? Uh, good morning, Lata. Uh, I think the broad domestic fundamentals on growth are doing quite fine. Uh, Although there is a distinct uh, composition difference that we expect the fourth consecutive year when investment growth will be surpassing consumption growth, which has not happened in India's history uh, in the past. Uh, but there, on the headline growth number, there could be a modest 50 basis point lower GDP growth. Uh, that's primarily because of global growth slowing materially. Uh, city global economists expect uh, global growth to fall from about 2.7% in 2023 to 1.9% in 2024. Uh, that headwind India will have to deal with, and that's primarily the reason why uh, we expect a 50 basis point kind of a slowing in uh, growth in FY25. But Shantaru, let me put in some glo uh, you know domestic constraints as well. One, the fiscal deficit will have to be brought down. That was quite a steroid in the last three years when we did very well, assuming it comes down to five and a half, that, uh, you know, that kind of capex growth may not be there. And secondly, as of now, there isn't enough conviction that uh, the government capex has handed over the baton to private capex. So, your estimates of growth. Yeah, thanks, Lata. Exactly uh, because of the fiscal drag, we think that growth will be lower. Uh, we are sub six and a half percent for fiscal year uh, 25. Uh, we are more optimistic on U.S. growth in particular. Uh, we think that U.S. growth is printing north of 2%. Uh, but given the fiscal drag uh, and especially the CapEx, uh, you know, as you said very correctly, has to, has to uh, come down. You, know, you cannot have CapEx growth in the region of 25-30% that you have seen in the last three or four years. This is going to be at best growing at nominal GDP growth rate or maybe even a little bit lower. So the private capex recovery, in our view, is more a second half story than the first half story. The first half story is still going to be uh, elections, and and therefore, you know, our our growth estimate is slightly lower than uh, six and a half percent for fiscal year twenty five. There are a good sixty percent of people in our poll who are expecting between six point two and six point four. Uh, so you have a lot of support, uh, Shantanu. On the same issue, uh, Sakshi. Uh, I, I mean, the other point that, uh, uh, do you see private capex picking on the baton at all? There seems to be, of course, bits and pieces, but uh, can it really fire growth, private capex? Uh, yeah, Lata, so uh, our estimate for next year is for growth at 6.3%. Uh, you know, we, growth is going to slow down from uh, uh, the global slowdown. And of course, we are going to see some amount of fiscal drag. Uh, I think on top of that, you will also see that monetary policy remains tight for at least the first half of the year. And, uh, you know, even if we get rate cuts in the second half, they are going to be very, very gradual. Uh, so all these factors will weigh on growth. I think on the private CAPEX side, uh, you know, I don't think that, you know, in the next uh, two quarters, we are going to see a significant revival. And I think we are, we are not going to see a broad-based pickup in private CAPEX. Mm. Uh, you know, once the election uncertainty is over, I do think that by the second half and towards the end of the second half of next fiscal year, you might start seeing more uh, broad-based signs of a private CAPEX revival. And why I say that is that 
capacity utilization rates are high in the economy. We are going to see a consumption slowdown, but not a collapse. Mm. So I think there will be a support on the consumption side as well. And I think that as you start seeing some slowdown on government capital expenditure, it should open up space for private capex to come in uh, to a greater extent. But I, I, I would say that that story is going to be towards the end of next year, not before that. Time permitting, I'll come to the consumption story as well. But Neeraj, before that, uh, some of the Reserve Bank's actions are not exactly helping uh, credit offtake. We have seen a spate of uh, deposit rate hikes because the Reserve Bank has kept near-term liquidity very tight. We've got a report from uh, Samiran, you know, just a few minutes back, uh, pointing out that this year, even at the end, December 31, we didn't see interbank liquidity going into surplus. It was a huge deficit of, you know, over 1 trillion rupees. So... Are you seeing deposit rates continue to rise and therefore lending rates? So, Lata, on liquidity, I think uh, Simran's take is absolutely on the point. Uh, you know, the government spending has not kicked in as much as expected, and which is what kind of leading to the interbank liquidity uh, in the deficit, even though the overall uh, system liquidity continues to be about 2 trillion plus surplus. So, it's lying as government balances with RBI. Uh, while the government has been spending, but if you look at the net difference between the receipts and expenditure, uh, I think it is uh, a, a bit sort of muted. And uh, expecting uh, that in the Jan to March quarter, we will see some of the spending come through. Uh, and if that spending comes through, then obviously it will have uh, some bit of a moderating effect on the interbank liquidity deficit. Otherwise, we expect the deficit to continue. I think the system liquidity will continue to be in a bit of a tight mode. Uh, uh, call rates uh, or overnight rates continue to be at the higher end of the corridor. Uh, and that obviously has uh, an impact on the short-term rates, money market rates, as well as the deposit rates. So uh, at least for the next three months, I do feel that the deposit rates are likely to stay a bit elevated, uh, particularly on the bulk deposit sides and on the CD rate side, where the you know, which is basically a market-driven sort of phenomenon. No, no, very, I don't... No, no, very much... briefly, Neeraj, do you expect cost of capital for industry to rise uh, in the first half and in the second half? How would you say? I think it is... Uh, I don't see a material change from here uh, until the you know until the end of, uh, I, I would say, June at least. Hmm. Uh, I see a very range-bound bond markets in terms of yields. Uh, I think deposit rates, uh, depending on which part of the deposit segment you look at, there could be some movements here and there. But broadly, it's a very, very stable okay. you know, rate regime that we are looking at currently. Okay, okay. so not uh, uh, endangering cost of capital. Uh, but uh, Samiran, let's br therefore bring the question to rates. Uh, you know, uh, the US market is running away with even five expectations of five rate cuts. Uh, your sense about how rates are headed in India, both the official rate and the yields. Uh, so, Lata, uh, monetary policy, in our view, would be a three-stage process in 2024. Uh, the first stage will be where uh, this divergence in banking system liquidity and durable liquidity uh, will come closer, and that would imply that the weighted average call rates will come closer to the repo rate rather than staying at the MSF rate. So this will be the first stage. This should be followed by the change in monetary policy stance, as the December policy minutes suggest that this was inactive consideration in that meeting. Uh, so we expect that the stance change happens in April. And then with a little bit of lag, maybe in August, when there is more clarity on the monsoon, uh, we see uh, a shallow rate cut uh, happen of about 50 basis point in uh, 2024. Uh, that would imply that the softening of monetary policy stance along with the global bond index inclusion-related inflows mm. uh, has the potential to take 10-year bond yields down closer towards 6.5% by end of FY25 is the view that we have right now. Mm. Uh, okay, so that um, explains the rate cuts. But, you know, that will depend on uh, inflation, isn't it? Uh, so, Shantanu, the Reserve Bank's own forecast is that, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, CPI inflation in uh, Q1 goes down to 5.2, and then it's 4, but comes up again to 4.7 in Q3 next year. So, you know, added to this is we don't know how this Red Sea issue that's pushing up freight rates, and those can have an impact. So, uh, your thoughts on inflation in 
2024? Yeah, so Lata, the, the first half uh, of the calendar year for us uh, looks not of 5%, closer to 5.5% uh, inflation. It really depends a lot on how food prices uh, behave, uh, especially the perishables, and it's very difficult to have a concrete forecast on that. So you'll have a lot of volatility around those prices. Second half of the calendar year, especially in Q3, is where you'll find uh, inflation coming down, largely due to the base effect of last year, and then rising back up again. Uh, overall, we are projecting, you know, 4.7% for the for the fiscal year 25. But I think on the rates front, overall monetary policy, there's a combination of a friendlier Fed. We are forecasting uh, as Goldman Sachs five rate cuts uh, in in 2024. There's ongoing disinflation. Oil prices are lower than where our forecasts have been earlier. So we've revised our oil price forecasts low towards 80. Uh, and you know we think that U.S. growth is still solid, so you are going to end up probably with uh, quite a bit of flows because of the risk-on environment, uh, especially for for emerging markets, uh, and that will help ease the liquidity situation Q2 onwards if the RBI chooses to uh, you know ease liquidity. So it's very easy at that point of time to absorb dollars in spot and just create uh, liquidity and not keep it as tight as what it is now. In terms of the process, though, I agree with Samir, it's going to be a process where they first uh, start easing liquidity, then go for a change in stance, and then we also have a pretty shallow uh, rate hiking, rate cutting cycle, only 50 basis points in, in calendar 24. Okay, I'll come to the other economist in a minute, but uh, uh, since, you know, bond inclusion is so much the conversation, uh, Neeraj, you know, how do you expect uh, this to, uh, you know, impact yields? Do you see a combination of U.S. I mean, of uh, rate, U.S. rate cuts and uh, the income coming in of this money and buying away Indian bonds, bringing yields down substantially? I mean, are we seeing uh, sub seven very soon for the ten-year, uh, well before June, and does it go all the way down to six and a half rate range this year? So I think for the first uh, half of this calendar year, I think we will be somewhere close to seven to seven quarter. The reason I say this is that we've already seen about eight billion dollars worth of flows in the last year, uh, particularly four and a half billion dollars in the last quarter. Uh, and the bond yields have actually remained very, very stable. They've been very range bound between seven quarter to say seven thirty five, seven forty level. Uh, I don't see this uh, flow of uh, liquidity into the system creating a large downward pressure on the yields as such, because we'll also have supply from the government. Uh, I think the next current, next fiscal borrowing program will start. Uh, you know, from April onwards. Uh, in fact, uh, we will have to see what the calendar looks like at the end of uh, February um, and in the budget, what kind of bonding program the government announces. But the market, you know, there will be supply for market to absorb uh, and this extra demand will obviously be spaced out over a period of time. It's not going to be one shot. So I think uh, at this point in time, I don't expect the 7% level to be breached over the next three or four months. Uh, bond yields will largely depend upon what the view on the policy is. And as I hear the economists say that it is likely to be a very shallow uh, rate cutting cycle, maybe biased towards the second half of this year. So as and when that expectation materializes in the market, we could see potentially a move